An apple may contain in the seeds some, let's say, substances hmm. which can release cyanide. Okay? okay, a very toxic substance, yes. extremely <laughs> toxic. The point is that those chemicals are present in such small amounts mm -hmm. in the seeds are also would really require us to eat the seeds, to chew them very mm -hmm. thoroughly, etc. That actually, in the end, the way we consume the apple, these seeds do not present any risk to us. Sharks in the ocean sound scary, right? But here is the thing. The sharks are actually the hazard. The risk, this depends on whether you're actually in the water. The same thing applies when we think about what we eat. And this is where dietary exposure assessment comes in. To help us understand better what this is, we're joined today by uh, Bruno Dujardin, who is uh, the team leader of EFSA's analysis team. Welcome, Bruno. Hi, thank you. <laughs> it's very nice to have you. No, well, it's very nice to be here. So Great. Yeah. So we dive straight in. Can you please give us a definition of what is exposure assessment? Well, a very specific single definition. I mean, it might be difficult to elaborate, but the concept is that we basically try to estimate the amount and the frequency to which we are exposed to substances that may mm -hmm. be of concern for human health. And well, in our case in EFSA, we mainly focus on dietary exposure. Why do we do it? Why is it important? I think the point is that very often when we talk about food safety, traditionally, there has always been a very strong focus on toxicology. Mm. And I think it's not only about toxicology, it's as you were saying with the shark. The shark is in the water, is a hazard, it's dangerous, but obviously it only becomes a risk when you are actually in the water. And it's the same for food. You may have certain substances which are present in food and which basically might be very hazardous, but as long as these amounts are very low and, and below a threshold of concern, actually they, they, they do not pose any risks. Okay, so in fact, if I take the example of an apple, for example, an apple may contain in the seeds some, let's say, substances hmm. which can release cyanide. Okay? okay, a very toxic substance, yes. extremely <laughs> toxic. The point is that those chemicals are present in such small amounts mm -hmm. in the seeds are also would really require us to eat the seeds, to chew them very mm. thoroughly, etc. That actually, in the end, the way we consume the apple, these seeds do not present any risk to us. On the other hand, we also have very beneficial substances in an apple, like vitamins. We also have sugar, which, I mean, is an essential component of the yeah. food. And the thing is that as long as you just eat an apple in, let's say, no, normal amounts, etc., mm -hmm. all this is not a problem. But if you start combining this with very high consumption of food supplements that contain certain vitamins, yeah. for example, or if you start really eating a lot of refined sugar on, on top of your daily apple, so yeah. to say, well, that might become a concern for your health as well. So it really shows how exposure is really a crucial point yeah. in, in, in defining the risk to substances. The way you explain it is very clear. It seems very straightforward. Is this really the case? What are some of the challenges? Well, I think, as you are saying, the basic principle of dietary exposure assessment is really simple. Mm. It's, it's no rocket science. So again, if we take the idea of the apple, and this is really how exposure assessment was done, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, mm. you know that, for example, the European population on average will consume maybe one apple every four days. Mm -hmm. If you then also know, let's say, at which concentrations this substance is present in the apple, with a rather simple mathematical calculation, yeah. you can kind of have an estimate of average exposure within the population. I think the challenge in the latest years has really come in the fact that we are no longer interested in this one kind of average consumer yeah. at European level. What we really want to know is, is how all this varies within the population. Of course, you can have in the first place variation in terms of, let's say, country, cultural background. Yeah. In certain cultures, certain foods are being consumed in much higher amounts than others. Yeah. But again, if we come back to the apple, as I said, we know that, that on average, it's one apple every four days mm -hmm. for European population. 
but also on a very personal level, there are some people who eat an apple every day you know, because... To well, keep the doctor away. Exactly. That's <laughs> okay. a very healthy habit, I would say. Yeah. But the point is that we no longer want to protect this kind of average consumer, but yeah. we really want to protect, uh, let's say, all possible consumers within certain limits. Of course, we cannot take into consideration all possible extremes, mm -hmm. but to actually get a grip over this variability within okay. the populations, within different population groups, that is currently the main challenge. We have a lot of data that allow us to do this, and this is great. probably the great advantage of the latest years that mm. a lot of data have become available that allow us to do this kind of more precise estimates mm -hmm. for different populations. That's basically where the complexity can come from yeah. when we try to do exposure assessments. Okay. On top of that, we also have the issue of population groups in terms of regional differences, yeah. cultural differences, but there is also obviously the age. We know very well that children, for example, are by default exposed to higher amounts of substances in yeah. general. That's also why we consider them as vulnerable population mm. groups. And there is a very simple explanation for that. The fact is that, let's say, a child compared to his body weight, mm. he's actually consuming much higher okay. amounts of food compared to the body weight. And therefore, this, this needs to, to be taken into consideration okay. when we assess uh, exposure to children. That's interesting, yeah. indeed. I'm also thinking about different groups also according to their dietary preferences. I'm thinking vegans, vegetarians. Do we have enough data to also take this into consideration or is it more work in progress? Uh, I would say this is work in progress. Mm -hmm. We have data for certain population groups, mm -hmm. such as you were mentioning, vegetarians. Yet, I think currently we do not really have evidence to show that they have a completely different risk pattern compared to, to let's say, the traditional population groups. I think it will very much depend also where the risk is. Okay, yeah. If we are talking about a substance that is typically present in, in plant products, Obviously, yeah. a vegetarian will have higher exposure to that. But if we are talking about a substance that is typically present in foods of animal origin, mm -hmm. obviously, let's say the traditional population uh, that is consuming foods of animal origin will okay. obviously be exposed to higher amounts. We also consume apples or apple products through different uh, other food, food sources. I don't mm -hmm. know, I'm thinking juices or purees mm -hmm. or whatnot, uh, sweets. How is this taken into, into consideration or is it taken into consideration mm -hmm. when you perform exposure assessment? Well, that is certainly taken into consideration and that is actually also one of the major difficulties that we often encounter when we assess dietary exposure. Mm -hmm. So obviously, if I know, again, talking about this apple, that there is a certain amount of a chemical in there, the same amount of apple juice, you might actually require two apples yeah. to produce uh, mm -hmm. that juice. Yeah? So that means that you will potentially have more of that substance of interest present in the juice, okay. provided that this substance is actually yeah. going into the juice. Okay. And that is a really important aspect because this type of behavior will be very determined by the substance that you are assessing mm -hmm. and by the characteristics of that substance. So we know that certain substances would actually move completely into the juice, whereas others will remain in this type of pomace obtained after the yes. pressing and will actually be discarded, maybe okay. go to feed. So that is okay. also not something to be forgotten. But the idea is really that you need to understand these dynamics and mm. to model them as well. So we have in, in EFSA developed actually a dedicated model for that, mm -hmm. that is converting all these type of composite foods and yeah, processed foods into the amounts of raw food equivalent. Okay. Right? And that facilitates a lot for yeah. us, this, this type of estimations, how okay. a substance may behave throughout the food chain, oh, let's that's say. Great. And, but it is really important, I think, mm -hmm. because I referred back to the apple, which is a very typical ingredient also that is consumed in very different ways, in very different types of processed foods. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the average consumption of apples, when you convert everything back to the raw apple, it's actually being doubled. Yeah? So, okay. so the exposure through the raw apples used, all, let's say, throughout the food, mm -hmm. food chain is double of the exposure from apples, let's say, consumed as such. So okay. I think that 
makes really a, a very big difference when yeah. you this do that cannot exercise. be cannot be simple to take into consideration <laughs> no 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 <laughs> and and especially i think uh, now i gave the example of uh, the apple but there are certain foods where it's even more like milk products for example the, yeah. all these foods that are typically used as mm -hmm. ingredients they they are like these silent contributors everywhere and, and it's really good to 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 be able to map that mm. so I imagine from what you're telling me, you also take into consideration the, the processing, the, the principal ingredient goes through. I'm thinking, I don't know, if you have to boil an ingredient or pasteurize it mm -hmm. or can it. Exactly. Especially processes that involve heating mm -hmm. will typically, I mean, I'm not saying in all cases, but may significantly reduce the concentration of chemical substances. Mm -hmm. But then... A new challenge arises because when these substances degrade, they can actually create metabolites, okay. which in some cases might even be more toxic than okay. the original substance. So there again, that really shows this importance of, of understanding how a substance behaves throughout the whole food chain. Um, if you want to perform, let's say, robust Exposure Ocean assessment. assessment. Yeah. So we started with a quite a straightforward concept and then <laughs> it's, it becomes more and more, let's say, complicated, of course, mm -hmm. which leads me to my next question, which yeah. is how did you actually end up in, in this field, in this area? Well, I studied biochemical engineering for very simple reasons. When I was in high school, I liked biology, I liked chemistry, I liked mathematics. These were my three favorite subjects. Good. So I thought biochemical engineering <laughs> sounds perfect for me. But while studying, actually, I started, uh, let's say, orienting towards food safety risk assessment mm -hmm. in general. So I was very much interested in that topic. I guess my passion for food and eating would definitely mm -hmm. play a role in that. But quickly, I, I started exploring these methodologies to assess dietary exposure. And I think in those days, we were really at an early stage. It's mm -hmm. really, we're talking end of the 90s when we were slowly entering into this data era. Yeah. No? So we started getting more and more data mm -hmm. and we were able to develop these type of models that, that were, let's say, more advanced mm -hmm. in, in trying to estimate the, the different types of exposure. You mentioned a couple of times the data and now that it's becoming more available mm -hmm. and it's kind of eased, let's say, or, or mm -hmm. enhanced the exposure assessment process. And actually our previous podcast episode was dedicated to food consumption data. Mm -hmm. uh, and in there, our guest Sophia mentioned in terms of what's coming up for data mm -hmm. collection, for example, this uh, possibility of maybe having even chips for more direct mm -hmm. retrieval of consumption data. In terms of the, the, the side of exposure assessment, mm -hmm. what do you think it's coming up? What does the future hold? I think definitely what the future holds in terms of exposure assessment is what we call human biomonitoring. Okay. I know this sounds a little bit scary, but a it's bit. actually quite interesting. These are actually surveys which are performed with voluntary participants. Okay. okay. And the idea is that we will actually in the first place measure the exposure to chemical substances in those humans. Yeah. Mm. And that is done by sampling their hair by sampling their urine. Okay. In some cases, we, they can also sample blood, for example. Mm. It's actually very similar to, let's say, you performing an analysis uh, okay. for, for your, your medical purposes. Mm. You know, It's actually a very similar system. But the point is that in those samples, you can find traces of the chemicals to mm -hmm. which all these people have been exposed to and actually provides you direct information on what people were exposed to. Okay. And that is actually very valuable information. And in EFSA, we are now making the steps towards trying to understand how we can make best use of those data in our assessments. Mm -hmm. The challenge that we have is that when you do this type of human biomonitoring, obviously you are not looking at chemicals only coming yeah. from dietary sources. There yeah. are chemicals coming also from non-dietary sources. Mm -hmm. And so there, the challenge in interpreting those data is to understand is that actually coming from dietary exposure or maybe from another exposure? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just to understand, to make sure I understood mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm thinking about my own routine. I'm a, I'm a heavy coffee drinker. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm also using a lot of cosmetics that contain or have listed as an ingredient mm -hmm. caffeine. Mm -hmm. This is maybe a bit of an oversimplification, but would it mean that it, my exposure to caffeine, this also plays a role 
I mean, to be honest, when it comes to caffeine specifically, I don't know how it penetrates to the skin. Okay. What, you know, what kind of exposure you have to it through dermal exposure. Yeah. Basically, that's called dermal exposure to okay. the skin. But I think you are touching on a very important point is that we know that for certain substances, for certain chemicals, we are exposed through different sources, not only through the diet. Mm -hmm. yeah? And I think the example you are giving is a very good example where, for example, in EFSA, we assessed the dietary exposure to caffeine. But when we did so, we also because our remit in EFSA is food safety, we did not take into consideration the exposure to the skin, for example, for this okay. type of skincare product it can also be used in medication, I think. So yeah. all these exposures have not been considered and it would not be bad to actually try in a more comprehensive way, understand what is that overall exposure to, in this case, caffeine. But there yeah. are plenty of examples that could apply. Yeah? Yeah. It's definitely not limited to, to caffeine only. And so for this also, we are now trying to connect also mm. with other partners, with, let's say, other EU agencies to try also and see how we can try to collaborate on this topic okay. to really kind of establish a framework that would allow us to consider those different uh, sources mm -hmm. of exposure again in a more comprehensive way because currently these responsibilities are also let's say divided across the agencies and so it would be really good that we kind of bring that together and in fact not only agencies but also member state organizations okay. so really this is also again one of the nice future challenges that we Great. have ahead. So. Working together for One Health. <laughs> yes, that, it's applying a One Health exactly. principle. Exactly. Great. Yeah. I think that's a great note to end on, Bruno. Hopeful yeah. for the future. Thank you so much again for taking part in the podcast. It was really a real pleasure to have you. No, well, it was a pleasure for me too. So thanks for inviting me. Thank you also very much to our viewers and listeners for joining us for another episode. Uh, remember, you can catch all the previous episodes on wherever you get your podcasts. For more science content, make sure to follow EFSA on our social media channels and visit our website. That's all for now, and I hope to see you next time on Science on the Menu. Mm -hmm.